So first of all, thanks for having me here. It's been very inspiring the last while. Um, lots of thoughts going through my head, and I don't know if you noticed I was sitting at the back there changing my presentation based on what I saw the last two days, because I do believe it's always good to respond to what you've experienced and kind of be in dialogue with what's happening around you. And I guess that's my key practice as an artist. So what I'm going to be doing today is presenting um, my role as an artist and how I'm trying to find myself, coming back to the question the other day to some of the panelists, what are you searching for? And this uh, kind of journey that I'm on. So I'll take you on a little journey. But before I take you on that journey, I need to introduce the fact that we're missing someone that was supposed to be with us, and that's Johannes Jäger. He's a biologist and philosopher. He was going to be on the screen facing you all and giving you some wise words of philosophy. But the reason why I cut him out was because um, when we started the session, you said we are completely live, except for Marcus. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know what, let's stay true to the completely live part and be embodied as much as we can. And he was quite happy because he said, I know the topic well enough, I've worked with him long enough, I'll be able to represent. So I feel quite proud that he gave me that, um, that possibility. So let's get started. Um, as I said, as an artist, uh, we're caught always in these spaces and these vulnerable conditions where we are trying to make sense of what's around us, the, the, the crises that we're facing as individuals and as communities. And it's really for us as artists to test those things and try to make sense of that world. Um, we live in these siloed spaces of you're making art, and even within art, you know, you're making performance, you're making music, you're making whatever, and we constantly exist in those silos. And what happens is we start to mistake those silos as reality. So what happens is we, in the art sector, believe that this is reality because this is the op space we operate in. And the moment we step out of that, we get a shock. And so the question is, how do we move away from that silo thinking and practice that we are being taught by most institutions to do and look at the maps that are around us and the and kind of perspectives that are around us and reinvent what those could be and how do we break the languages of these institutionalized thinking we had a session earlier on that's, that touched on uh, language limitations and that's really the issue that if i as an artist know how to operate in one way and i can only operate with that language what do I do to find a new way of expressing that which we cannot express because it's something new? You know, there's a new dialogue, there's a new audience, and yet we can't speak the same language. So it's really about looking beyond that which defines us, uh, but specifically from the industry. We know the industry is very problematic and we need to constantly reinvent it. There's a whole other presentation on the value chain and how we can actually fit into that and, and shift it. Um, but I think as an artist, I need to always think about where am I and how do I relate myself to that context and that industry. So how do I deal with also the systems that have been put in place to deal with crises of the past? We're in a new world, we're in a new direction, so we have to rethink our own borders and boundaries. So within this search or building of a new world, I guess, I mean, it's a very optimistic and idealistic concept, but we want to find a new view. And what's interesting is that there are a lot of disciplines that are suffering from the same situation. They have to reframe, they have to reshift, they have to reorganize. And what I've noticed as artists, I've actually got something to offer these other places. You know, the scientists in the world, the philosophers in the world, the industry in the world. I actually have a skill as an artist that I'm underselling. I've got the ability, as so many of you have presented, of looking at the world in a very different way, of feeling the emotion, of connecting on a personal basis to people that are completely different to me, and yet I can find a thread. And that is very rare. That is a, uh, an outcome of our practice and our process and our trust in the process that I think we need to nurture and find that relationship. And in comes the zone, which is the, sp the concept that I want to introduce to you today. So the zone is a space uh, in collaboration with the philosopher and biologist, who's currently not on the screen, Johannes Jäger, artist Bronwyn Lace, and a curator, Basak Chernova. We joined forces a few years ago to say what happens if you had the silo of art and the silo of science, and we just paid in between. What if they, someone had invented an extra silo that was undefined? And what is that space? What is that zone that can only be defined by what we do, rather than a zone that is defined by the institutions that define it? Bizarre concept, but philosophically quite exciting. And so this project has started as a transdisciplinary collaboration to say what is that third space that goes beyond the arts and sciences, that tries to kind of twist its way between, but doesn't steal from the one and give to the other, or borrow from the one and sell to the other, but actually 
really tries to be raw in its exchange. Very difficult thing to do, almost impossible, but it's about finding the possibility to exchange these uh, knowledge networks, to have personal experience and, and play with these spaces. So that zone. And uh, a few years ago, Johannes Jäger got a beautiful grant, which we're very happy about because it always helps to have money to do this to work. And his grant, which is called Pushing the Boundaries, um, uh, with the Department of Philosophy, actually, which is also very exciting, at the University of Vienna, um, literally looks at the fact that we are at a civilizational turning point that we really need to think about very, very carefully. Um, we are in this meta-crisis, this evolving meta-crisis that's around it. We've got everything from climate issues to revolutions to wars to pandemics to personal traumas. And in this space of crisis, um, we have to start to abandon the view of the world as a machine. You know, we believe that the world is actually there to service us and we can take a screwdriver and we can tighten the nuts and change the bolts and suddenly it will carry on working. And this fundamental uh, kind of approach to the world as a machine is something that's very deeply rooted in our language, in the way we operate, in the way we invest, in the way industry ab abuses our environment. And we need to shift to a kind of more systemic, evolutionary and organic view of this kind of complex reality that we're in. And so philosophically, this project is challenging um, how we do that and what, how we could go about it. But the most kind of pressing task about all of this is how we view ourselves in that space, that we are not self-optimizing machines. This is something that like, really dawned on me when Yogi said, this is, this is the crux of it. You know, we, we're in the state where we uh, think that we as humans can just carry on and do and do and do, but actually we need to step back. Earlier on, someone said, slow down, you know, long take find that space. And in order to do that, we really have to think about what kind of organismic agency do we have? And does our world have? And how is that an alternative to the way we currently see the world? Philosophically very complex. And um, Johannes Jäger and his team are looking at it from a biological, scientific, mathematical point of view and really analyzing in different ways what that could mean. It's revolutionary in his thinking because he has to unpack all of this historic knowledge that always gears us towards that outcome where we are now and saying, well, how do we revolutionize that and change that? And so then the question is, if that's at the crux, what do we as artists do in relation to that? So how do we as artists position ourselves and how do we help him? How do we take the skill that we've got of embodied experiences of making people feel and do that? And it's been an incredible learning curve for the last four years in trying to find that alternative. And why I thought it was very important for the unsettling is because it has unsettled everyone that we've worked with. Whether it's the scientists, whether it's the institutions, whether it's communities that we engage with, the kind of exhibitions that we put up, the studios that we open up to invite people, it's become a completely complex space of experimentation and, um, and unease and vulnerability. And everyone's unhappy in that vulnerability and then afterwards feels comfortable again. It's a very strange cycle that we go through. Anyway, while these studio experiences are happening at the moment, I want to take you back for a second. I want to show you what's relevant to us here in South Africa. And that is a whole trajectory of work. And when I was looking back at the examples that I'd like to show you, as some of the talks here have influenced my decision on what to show you. So I'm going to take you on a journey of about four projects. Um, the first one in this intersection of art and science is called Sutherland Ref Reflections. It's a project that I did with Bronwyn Lace for about eight years in collaboration with Kevin, Kevin Govender and the late Carolina Oatman Govender. They're two astrophysicists and nuclear physicists working in Sutherland. Now, Sutherland's home to this beautiful, attractive site of all these international domes. It's a beautiful space where you can see the two Magellanic clouds with your naked eye. It's incredible for stargazing, and the whole world believes it. So billions get invested into the space, and it's incredible to go to. That's what you see, and it's so exciting. At the foot of this place is a small town called Sutherland, which suffers from this legacy of apartheid, so heavier than most other places, like most small towns in the Karoo, is really struggling with the this disparity. And when we started this project many years ago, it was very, very extreme. And you can see the split of the of the of this small town of 3,000 people, where the majority of people live in poverty and a small portion live in wealth. And we know where that comes from. I don't have to reiterate um, the journey. But why I want to show this project is because what happens when art and science meet? Who is in the middle of the two? 
And that's the people. That's the, the audience that you want to talk to, the people that you want to engage, the context of human bodies and people that have questions about both the creative space, the one side of the brain, and the other side of the brain. And so we were asked for the International Year of Astronomy to open the year with a big show on this, on this platform, with a light show or something, to kind of show how great astronomy can be. And we actually said, no, we would like to go into this little town and we want to, on the 1st of January of the International Year of Astronomy, fly a kite. Because a kite is the first way to look up. Simple. Get people to look up and suddenly you start to create a connection between that which the scientists are pursuing and that which is on the ground. Now, that one kite led into eight years of collaborative work and playful experiments with various groups of the communities because the moment we flew the one kite, we had about 200 kids around us all going, and me, <laughs> at work, I also want to fly one. And suddenly we realized that this, and this community that joined us was mainly the poorer part of the town, mainly the colored community in this area, and um, actually only the colored community in the area. And it became very evident that there was, um, this disparity was much more extreme that we, uh, than, than we ever thought. Fetal alcohol syndrome, history, uh, abusive, uh, abusive history, um, the, the, the forced removals, obviously we know the, the story, uh, the, the DOP system, etc., etc. I don't want to go into a lot of detail now, but we realized how deeply entrenched the problem really is. And so we started to talk about perspectives. We did experiments every year with... Um, with, with, as you see, trying to get as many kites into the sky as possible to break that barrier. We played with what it means to change your landscape, to, to take ownership of land in a completely new way. Um, and it started with the kids because they were wanting to play. There wasn't much, there's not much entertainment there. And we never said we were artists, you know? We became the Fleer Mensa. It was a fun game that we were playing to say, what can we just do to activate space? How can we um, have a group of people break that border between the one part of the town and the other part of town by by creating a parade through it? How can we print out their pictures and blow them up large and put them all over town so people can see that they can own the buildings that they're not allowed to go to? Uh, how can we put sculptures down the road that connect the white, na white neighborhoods to the colored neighborhoods and try to create a, a, a journey through? And all of this was happening, obviously, in the shadows of this big telescope. And so we started to speak to the observatory and say, come, you guys need to come on board, we need to collaborate. And so what we started to do is really develop this uh, uh, community center, and we got a star bus where we took people up to the observatory and we all cladded it nicely, so it was a lot of fun. And we started these activities to really try to link what the scientists were doing and what we were doing. And what was exciting is the scientists were really um, too busy looking at the stars, you know. And so when we said to the ki kids, so what do they do up there? The one kid said, they're looking at the Big Bang. So what is the Big Bang? So we went to a China shop there, they've got these rope lights with batteries, and the kids started to recreate the ever-expanding universe while I was on a water tower photographing them, and then giving them the photographs of their Big Bang. So then owned, they owned this idea that they designed their own Big Bang. And these were the kind of things we were doing to try to make sense of this place. It developed into complete uh, chaos and mayhem because we invited other artists, we invited architects, we invited um, uh, philosophers and researchers, and eventually the community center grew into something. And still, we were not artists, we were just there. And this is so interesting that we were messing with this idea of who, how we define ourselves in this space. We just thought it's more important to do something than to try to make art. You know, let's allow our skills that we have to do something. And what happened is it inspired others. So um, archaeologists, astrophysicists, etc., came on board. And very quickly we spoke about forced removals. The elders started to trust us. After three years, the elders came to us and said, I want to show you something. This is where we used to live. This is where we were removed from. Very emotional moments where for the first time they shared photographs and stories with a white man about their own history and about the complexity. And for the first time, they shared it with their kids. So here the kids are drawing in ribbon the lines of the footprints of the buildings that these old people used to live in that they were never able to share with them, just simply because there was no interest and no motivation to do it because it was taboo to speak about it. And slowly we started to realize that through art, archaeology, and astronomy, we could tell stories that were never being told before in a healing and, uh, well, forget healing, in a cathartic way for that moment. It was never healing. It's just a moment of, of, of escape. And the Science Center, for example, that's on the plateau at the top, ended up having the little shards of glass that was evidence from the Ola Kasi that was being destroyed that we then built as an installation representing the people down below as a, uh, as a night sky. 
Um, we also worked with the old age home because that's where all the stories were and we collected stories of, of the stars that you wouldn't believe. Um, and then one day, this, we were told, but we can't go there because only the international people can go there. You know, there's the, uh, the Japanese dome, the German dome, etc. And so we're not allowed on that space. And so we said, come, into the star bus, we go up, and we had a group of, you see a whole group of, of people together, and with our walking sticks, we created the Sutherland Dome. So we claimed that land, and we said, if every country can have an embassy, so do we. And so we proudly stood there, and we claimed, we drew a line in the sand, and we said, this is now ours, and said, this land is ours, and it took us two years to convince the scientists that we allowed to have a piece of that land, a lot of fights. But eventually we built our own Sutherland Dome. It's now a community dome that stands up there and is open to anyone from Sutherland. It's the embassy. It's a naked eye telescope. It's done in a Corbell building style from the area with a geodesic dome echoing the large Sutherland telescope there, SALT. And it stands on the path up, and it's a place that gets visited occasionally by poets. Little fires get made in it, and it's a, it's a place of reflection, and it's beautiful in there because from there you have that kind of view into the night sky. It's the most magical experience of being there. But symbolically, it's that moment where the artwork becomes a representation of a process that says land ownership, questions of um, being part of it. The project then evolved um, into a book and a film where we really went in, into depth of creating timelines, trying to think about where do we belong on this larger timeline of, of Earth's existence and, and you know, the little segments um, uh, that, that come straight off the dinosaurs. <laughs> and, and this film really explores in various levels um, where we stand and who we are in relation to these mega scientific projects. But artists, archaeologists and astrophysicists were in the making of trying to connect people to a knowledge system that they'd lost, an identity that they'd lost due to religion, due to farmers, etc., etc. We know the story. And suddenly there was this openness to talk about a culture that they would like to reconnect to. And then comes the SKA, and our question straight after was, well, afterward was, well, as you're listening to, with radio telescopes into space, trying to reach the Big Bang, who's listening to the people in the shadows? Because really they are the ones that are going to be living and the dry land that is not getting any water and have to struggle through um, the lived experience. And that's my little daughter running there. And I thought it was symbolically very important because it positions why we do this in the first place. It's no longer about me, it's about someone else. And so I wanted to take you on that journey because it's a, quite an in-depth uh, version of how the space of art and science gave inspiration to actually connecting to people that, that didn't know what we were doing. And, kind of just opened up their homes and their lives and their stories to, to growing together into something. And this got extended into Bloemfontein. This is now um, in the observatory, um, in the planetarium in Bloemfontein. It used to be an observatory where a lot of people living around Naval Hill never knew what this thing is. It was the thing from, from, the, from, the, from the previous government that's up there on Naval Hill, people walk through it, and you, you'll know it. <laughs> people walk through past it, but the school right below, the Naval Hill School, for example, they've got the same name, but they've never been. You know, the kids don't know this. So we end up taking over the planetarium and creating a planetarium inside. Um, and the whole idea was to create a planetarium show with local stories, reflecting on who we are and what it means to write our own stories into the stars, because we're still dealing with the damn star pictures from the Greeks. Who cares about that? So the idea was, how can we create a vertical journey looking at our archaeology, our history, and a projection into the future in a completely new way? This is a little trailer that we made, and it was a planetarium show that ran for uh, uh, two years, so two different shows that we designed, and it took you through a journey of existence and rediscovery, a new planet, a growth, and, and uh, reimagining what happens when the path is slightly different for you. What happens when your history is not written the way it is? When the maps that are drawn for you are not the maps that you want and you can change them? And it gave a completely new life to the... Our shout! <laughs> no, it doesn't work on the computer. It's done. It's done. Um, it just gave a new life to the idea of what a planetarium should stand for. Um, and you can see it became installation, it became performance, it became projection, it became storytelling, it became singing. And it really started to take a completely new dimension in terms of dialogue between um, a space for scientific pursuit and education and a studio. A studio for community stories. 
And we've got one right here, which I'll show a picture of later on, which is not being used in, in the NMU, a brand new planetarium that has to be taken over. Oh, there, that way, exactly, that way. <laughs> and, um, and so what was amazing about these moments for me is the, the, the depth of story, the depth of reflection, the true uh, um, encounter that people had that weren't necessarily artists. We were dealing with students, we were dealing with, with um, uh, uh, all, well, all walks of life coming and saying, we would like to be part of this based on the, the fact that the project continued. And it went, went online during COVID, which was quite interesting. Um, I'll show you a little clip. Um, we had to, the third planetarium show happened on Zoom. And what was really amazing, I suddenly realized, wow, Everyone's home is a studio. Everyone's bedroom is a space to explore. Here you've got Molisile Bongwana and um, uh, Tulisile Binda who lived together before and were separated during the pandemic and here are doing a performance in relation to each other. It's the most heartbreaking thing when you're seeing this live on your screen. So he's got a screen, a camera, she's got a camera. Uh, this is um, a scientist at the planetarium uh, also live, and all of these people are live on the screen, 30 odd people all doing something live in their own homes and all I'm doing is I'm DJing, putting that screen in, putting that screen in, and creating a performance, there's Minet, by the way um, someone was saying, that's Minet's hand breaking some <laughs> you were talking about earlier um, this was in Joburg, in the studio in Joburg, someone angle grinding, and you can see the dynamic that starts to happen when you have these multiple layers of performers doing something live, in the moment, being raw being true to that which, which is what we usually hide away. We hide away the process of making. And here they just put all of it out. And it was depressing. It was hard. You all in COVID, you know what it was like. And this was the moment where I realized it's, it's in that stuff that we've got something to offer that, that so few people know how to, how to express. And the magic that came from it are just these hours and hours of interactions where we invite an audience to join and then we asked the audience to turn off the lights in their rooms so that everything was dark and take a candle and dance with us. And suddenly I realized that in every little home there were people doing little things that were connected by one screen. That's powerful. That really made me feel like there's something. And when we ask people to wrap themselves, I mean, there you see it. Gives me goosebumps just watching it. Anyway, <laughs> it's that moment when you realize that actually all of the complexities around what we search for and how we try to justify who we are and make sense of who we are, it's about giving ourselves and others a voice. It doesn't matter who you are, give the other person a chance to speak. And that giving someone else a chance to speak is a very generous offer. It's very difficult as an artist because you're being taught, I've, I'm the ego. And if you've suffered trauma, I need the stage now. If you've, you know, it's, it's, but even in that moment, when Fatou Sisa put that packet of her head in a performance we did in Paris together with some live presentation from around the African continent, it was that inability to communicate. It's the most, she's a performer from Senegal that we've done a lot of projects together about the, the tension between her, yeah, whatever, slavery and history. And, and it's for me, these projects are about exactly that voice, exactly that. And so I, have to, I did a little in, in, uh, detour here, still look good on time, um, where I uh, got an opportunity to send a drawing of mine into space. So um, I've got a little drawing floating on the ISS at the moment. And when that happened, I was like, oh, wow, you know, this is a, a whole other story. This drawing is floating in space at the moment, and it's a symbol of hope. It's got a whole story behind it, which I won't get into. But there was this moment where, where I then said, well, actually, it can't go by itself. It needs the voices of others, too. If I've, I've got the privilege to send this drawing, so I convinced the people that offered me this opportunity to send this. And so floating in space at the moment is not just my little drawing, but little pieces, little symbols of the team that's been working on the Imaginary Futures project. So you see the names below um, that, that have each contributed to an idea of a message that they want to send into space to create this collaborative um, element. And so this little piece, which is one cubic centimeters, just like my drawing, is inside the box that you see there, which is the moon gallery that's currently float. Well, it's actually back now. It was floating in the ISS for a year and a half. Um, and it's just come back to Earth, and it should be going to the moon in two years' time. Um, and it becomes a symbolic gesture of how far your voice can travel. And if I tell you that the same people that were on this little Zoom screen, screaming their hearts out at each other, heard that their voices are going to be heard in the form of a little symbol in, on the moon one day, it was the most incredible spatial vision 
in terms of where it could go and what it could be. And so those are moments that make me very proud to say there is the ability to, to, to symbolically at least, if we can't always be heard, we can symbolically make the gesture so you feel heard. And feeling heard is a big step towards actually eventually being heard um, as an artist. And so for me, the scientific space is really that because scientists are actually listening. They, do, they are interested. There is the questioning. The, the philosophers are curious about the world and are saying, well, things need to change because they know the facts. And so we've had a few experiments here. So this Eastern Cape experiences where we had artists and scientists meet place. Um, so bringing it back to Earth. This was done with Mary Duke with the university here where we got artists and science students to come together and go explore different spaces, go to Kabucha, uh, explore the valley, walking through, documenting, capturing, thinking, dreaming, designing, and actually just saying, well, how can art and science collaborate in a way to actually change our environment to create better spaces? This is the park right opposite here. And very interesting, you know, when, when things like issues of hybrid plant life, similar to concerns of migrant politics, is a note that someone's taken on the workshop that we did. And you go, well, actually, this is what we deal with on a daily basis. And the biologist is dealing with it, the artist is dealing with it, but we don't see the connection in the zone between the two. And so you, I think I'm illustrating the, the reality of, I think, where personally there's a very, very big opportunity to bring the two together and say we can actually um, play with the space. So I'm going to just show you these glimpses of what we did last year here on this building. So this is projecting little stories, images, and concepts onto the building and having a bit of fun. This is just, a, again, just playing with uh, uh, journeys and stories of art and science. Um, this is literally um, uh, on, on the facade here. Uh, little moments of drawing live and projecting up um, artists' works. Um, and then we did the same um, uh, on the dome, um, which is the wonderful, oh, there you see it, um, the, 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 the planetarium that you guys have here at the, on campus. And so we projected on the outside because we see we're not allowed in yet. So let's take our occupation of the outside. And next step for me is let's move inside and do the same there. So, so this again is the provocation to say there's a beautiful stage there. Let's do something with it. I like the fact that the dung ball is taken over the <laughs> dome. And then last but not least, um, I'll be one minute over my five minute limit, if that's OK. Um, right now in Cape Town, we're developing um, another part of the work, which is to say, how does our cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, multimodal approach to art making happen? So the one hand, you've got the scientists, and you want to have a dialogue with the philosophers and scientists, and they're very exciting exchanges, and you've got these workshops and sessions. But what happens to us as an artistic community? How do we throw our ideas together too? And so um, last year, at the Center for the Less Good Idea in Johannesburg, um, a piece was developed called This Death Here um, by Mark Fleischmann. And it's a piece where I was invited as a visual artist to be part of a larger team. And the whole idea was to um, uh, participate in a kind of collective way of making. And I was drawing, because my passion is drawing and projecting, uh, while everyone else brought their own bits and pieces together. And the story was about Daedalus. And Daedalus, who built Icarus's wings for Icarus to fly to the sky, and then Icarus dies because the wings melt and he falls to the ground. And, and so, on the one hand, we celebrate the genius because we taught that that's what we are as humans. And this piece that you're going to see now, which is a short four-minute um, video, is the response of the chorus, which represents the gods, the, the, the beings bigger than us, that comment on the fact that we as humans have come, especially man, it's called man, man has come, Man has conquered, man has done this, man has done that, we've invented, we've done all these things that, that scientists are so proud of, we've done all these things that, that we think are good for us, but at the end, when man dies, it's changed nothing. And this is the, the, the curiosity of this piece. So you might not understand all the words, um, I've got the text if you like, but uh, just enjoy a few minutes of song and visuals. Um, here we go.
So the reality of the destruction, the fact that we can't heal in the, in the face of death, becomes the crux of the moment where a new world starts and what you're seeing actually, all the drawing is live drawing. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing live over the performers as the performance is happening. And, uh, and, and then that gets recorded and, and played back. And so the actual world that then gets created with Neo Muyanga playing live now, so that's him playing live music, is uh, me drawing live to his, um, to his sounds. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to do this a little bit. <laughs> um, a world arises, which is the world post us. And then the question really is, what is that world post us? And what are we leaving behind? And, and so in that sense, this piece uh, does ask a few um, questions so relevant to the moment that we're in, where um, we're sitting between the space of uh, crises, scientists trying to deal with it, artists trying to deal with it, narratives emerging and for me the zone in between has really been a really inspirational moment and I actually think a model towards an alternative way of engaging with our discipline in breaking the boundaries that we find ourselves in and it's been a really rewarding process and I wanted to share this with you because it's 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 broken so many of my boundaries and it kept me in check at every step of the way in terms of how I position myself to the rest of the the, the context of the art world. Um, so I hope this has contributed to the conference in any kind of meaningful way because I, I made the connections. I hope you can too. And um, obviously condensed a lot into this, but that was my intention, to throw things at you and have something sticks because I think the discussions can come from there. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.